healthcare is too expensive. Employers are offsetting costs onto their employees. Who will make health benefits affordable for hard-working Americans and their families? You, you will. will. This is the Empowering Plans Podcast, a show dedicated to helping you once again emphasize the benefit in your benefit plan. Now prepare to learn, plan, save, and protect with the FIA Group. Well, hello, hello, hello. Welcome once again to an Empowering Plans podcast with the FIA Group. You know, I almost said, as always, I am Ron Peck, Chief Legal Officer of the FIA Group. But then I realized 90 plus percent of these podcasts do not include yours truly, which, you know, some may say is a bit of a shame, but I think it's no great loss for most. Where I think that those who are listening in today truly benefit has nothing to do with me. It has to do with today's co-host, Corey Krigger, attorney Corey Krigger. Hey, Corey, how you doing? I'm doing great, Ron. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to hear that because, you know, when you're feeling good, then you do good. And I think for everybody who's taking the time today to listen to this podcast, we owe them that. We owe them not just the good, but the great, our best effort. So without further ado, let's jump into today's topic. We're going to be discussing something that in a couple of weeks, and again, I understand that these podcasts are recorded and they're posted online. And so I could be referencing something that's going to happen in the future. And then for you, the listener, this is something that happened already in the past. So I'm just going to say that as of the time of recording this podcast, in a week, we're going to be doing a live webinar about this topic. And we're going to do a much deeper dive. This podcast is only about 15 minutes, whereas the webinar is an hour. We're going to be doing a deeper dive into this topic, but it definitely deserves some extra attention. It's something about which our organization has been receiving multiple questions from all different angles, areas, aspects of the industry. And that topic is cellular and gene therapy or CGT, right? So cell therapy, gene therapy. Wow. You know, this is just one of those topics where it's been brewing for a while. And then all of a sudden it just blows up and everybody's talking about it. You know, we saw the same thing when it was time for Obamacare, the same thing with COVID, the same thing with the No Surprises Act. And now we're seeing it with cellular and gene therapy. And I think it's because, and I mentioned in a post online when I was advertising the upcoming webinar, this one, it triggers that internal conflict. I think for a lot of people in our industry where on the one hand, we are always happy to see new forms of treatment, new forms of care that are going to result in better outcomes for patients. Because ultimately, we're in the industry, we're in the business of health benefits. We care about people's well-being. That's why we do what we do, right? Otherwise, what's the point? We could save a lot of money by just not paying for anything. That's not what we do. We sponsor and promote and pay for healthcare because it's important. So when there's a new development in healthcare that's going to result in better outcomes and healthier people, we celebrate that. That's a wonderful thing. But at the same time, we have to be pragmatic. We have to be realistic. We have to ask ourselves, how are we going to pay for this new technology? And I think that we recognize that this is potentially going to represent a major cost for plans moving forward. Before we get into the details, Corey, and I turn it over to you for your opening statement, I just want to clarify, you know, we throw the terms cell or cellular therapy and gene therapy around. And while there's certainly a lot of similarity, you know, cell therapy, it's where they're transferring actual intact live cells into a patient to cure a disease. Whereas with gene therapy, they're taking genetic material for the treatment and prevention of disease. So very similar. In some instances, they're taking a patient's genetic material, they're shipping it out, they're testing it, they're creating a custom treatment based on that genetic makeup, shipping it back and sticking it back in that patient. And you know, we saw a lot of that with cell therapy for types of cancer. For those who know my family's history with cancer and my wife's, thank goodness, victorious battle against cancer, certainly we experienced some of that not for her, but for other patients in the facility where she was treating, even then, the CAR-T treatment. So, you know, this has been going on for a while. In 2019, before the COVID pandemic, the FDA was predicting 
20 new types of cellular and gene therapy by the year 2025. I will tell you that in 2020, obviously the pandemic hit and it caused a substantial decrease in the amount of development, clinical trials, demand for this. And really we only saw five or so by 2022 new approved CDTs. But, you know, in this year, 2023, we're now seeing over 1,000, I think it's something like 1,500 clinical trials. Some of these drugs are carrying multi-million dollar price tags. Hengenics, mm -hmm. I know, $3.5 million. And now there's an estimate for 2025 that there are going to be nearly 100,000 individuals that are eligible for these types of treatments at an anticipated cost of over 20 billion, I think $25 billion. So <laughs> I'll let that sink in. It's a lot of money. It's a lot to take in. Corey, I know you've been looking into this topic and I know you deal with provider relations. And so your daily struggle is you know, communicating with providers who admittedly are providing valuable health care, but also trying to sort of deliver the message of, you know, the reality that if these plans are bankrupt tomorrow, there won't be anyone to pay in the future and, and trying to strike that balance. So this news must really impact you in particular. Share your thoughts as far as this topic is concerned. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for the great intro. You know, I think much like AI, cell and gene therapy is a buzzword right now, right? Where everyone's just throwing it around and not really everyone's digging down to like what it actually means. I think you can look at this in a couple different ways, Ron. One, you can kind of step back and realize that we're in the middle of a medical breakthrough, which is a fantastic time to be alive, right? Where diseases that have plagued society are now being eradicated because of breakthroughs in modern science. And that is excellent. And then you can look at it from the pragmatic standpoint, as you mentioned, dealing in provider relations, that the bottom line in provider relations and kind of, we had a new hire here just a couple of weeks ago. And what I told him summed up provider relations was, how do we provide high quality, low cost healthcare to our clients? Everything that we touch in provider relations is about making sure that an objective standard is paid and we're kind of protecting the plan. And you mentioned it, hemogenics, which is the gene therapy right now that's out for a type of hemophilia, that $3.5 million price tag, it'll make plan sponsors and those running these self-funded health plans run for the hills. But I do think there's something important to point out, Ron, that the context around this, it's a $3.5 million payment for the therapy. But absent this therapy, the annual cost to a health plan for someone just treating standardly with hemophilia B is $600,000 a year anyway. So, you know, when I was researching the hemogenics and looking up hemophilia B, there's multiple transfusions that a person with this condition has to go through a year. And they project, like I said, $600,000 a year annually that a plan was going to pay to carry this participant anyway. So on a long enough time table, you can look at some of these therapies and say, yeah, it's a big price tag up front, but in the long run, it's good for the plan. And then, Ron, the next logical question is, is, okay, in the long run, this is good for the plan. How do I pay that upfront price tag? And I think that's what keeps everyone up at night. But have no fear. There are different ways that I've seen that the market is demanding that three and a half million doesn't mean three and a half million now in a lot of ways. So it is nice to see that these big pharmaceutical companies are willing and they understand that not every self-funded plan is going to be able to pony up three and a half million dollars for gene therapy. And there are market solutions that are coming to and different ways to structure your plan, either through stop loss or kind of a gene therapy specific pre-service SCA that's based on, you know, we will pay as the treatment provides the benefit. And maybe we're going to spread that three and a half million dollars over two, three, four years and the payments only do so long as the treatment's effective. So there are solutions out there and there are ways to control the cost for these drugs that are for the betterment of society. You know, Corey, I'm glad you bring up the matter of timing because one of the concerns that has been presented to us, the FIA group, by some of our clients is this concern that, you know, if I have somebody who has a chronic disease and I'm paying on this sort of protracted, uh, capitated schedule, if that employee, if that plan participant leaves the plan, leaves my employment, goes to work somewhere else, well, now it's somebody else's problem. Whereas if I'm paying three, $3.5 million up front, and then right after I cut that check, that employee leaves a week later, 
I've provided this benefit and someone else is reaping sort of the benefit of a happy, healthy employee. And so it's not just a matter of the finances, but also a matter of that cost benefit analysis where I know that I am providing a benefit to an employee who in turn is providing a benefit to me that is an employee and providing that work product that I'm not going to front millions of dollars to treat someone just so that they can leave and go to another employer who in essence benefits off of my dime. So I think that idea or that concept of trying to identify ways to stretch out the payment, it serves multiple beneficial purposes. You know, when we talk about cellular and gene therapy, some of the old issues or topics that we've talked about in the past come up again. And in particular, and we're both attorneys, well, I'll admit it, right? Although we rarely act like it, it's important to recognize different federal laws and, and laws that are going to impact how we provide this type of benefit, this type of treatment to our employees. You know, of course, there's ERISA and that obligation to act in the interest of all the participants, to enforce the plan prudently. And so you need to ensure that whatever it is you plan to do as it relates to this type of treatment, to cellular and gene therapy, that the plan document accurately reflects mm. your approach. You don't want to have the plan say one thing and then you do something else. If you're planning to come up with a way to exclude it, again, I'm not going to touch upon the wisdom of that just yet, but if that's your plan, you have to make sure the plan document supports that. If your intent is to cover this type of treatment, you have to make sure the plan document covers that. So one, having the plan document align with your approach. Another issue or topic that comes up that this is not something you often talk about, Corey, is GINA, which is the Genetic Information Act, right? Where you're not allowed to use genetic information to make coverage decisions or employment decisions. And when we're talking about medication that's highly customized or targeted to this type of thing, that being genetic makeup or genetic material, you know, the question is going to come up whether GINA plays a role. If you're denying or excluding coverage, is somebody going to argue that it's prohibited by GINA? Likewise, HIPAA. The fact that we're not just dealing with somebody's medical condition, but also their genetics, that's just more PHI that you have to be aware of, more data that's being transferred back and forth, more protections that have to be put into place. And then, of course, we have the ACA. And I know this is the one that's giving the most heartburn to plan sponsors, is this question of, is cellular and genetic therapy some form of, or could it be considered to be a form of essential health benefits, right? Is it something I'm required to cover under my plan? And if so, I better figure out how I'm going to afford it versus those who say, can I just deny it? Can I exclude it in general? And so that's a bit of a tricky question there too, because one of the big topics or issues when it comes to essential health benefits, is it something I should cover? Is it something I should provide? Is the question of efficacy. Does it actually work? Right. And so these are some of the things that people are asking is, can I deny it? And is my ability to exclude it somehow hinge upon whether it's going to be effective? And so I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on some of those issues or things that are keeping our clients up at night. Yeah, absolutely. I think the plan document, Ron, making sure that your plan document accurately lives out your vision is important, but also you have to do those gap reviews with your stop loss policy, because that's really where you're going to get hammered, right? That's where you don't want to be in the business of including a drug that maybe your stop loss carrier at the time that you signed your stop loss agreement wasn't contemplating carrying and then not having that carried over, right? And then you have this huge gap and you were expecting to pay whatever your attachment point was. And then all of a sudden you have a $1.5 million rest of it to follow behind it. And I think that's the things that you have to make sure your house is in order. You have to make sure that everything is by the book there because you don't want that gap between the plan document and the stop loss. And then Ron, your second point that you talked about and really the efficacy, what we're getting into there is this term, which I love to say, being from Eastern Kentucky, it just really brings out all my accent, right? Pharmacogenomics of actually looking at how your body breaks down certain medications and then increasing the efficacy of that. And the example that I read when I was preparing for the podcast this week, was kind of near and dear to my heart. Being from Eastern Kentucky, you know, Ron and Fia is very aware of this as, as all of our listeners. Eastern Kentucky and that Appalachian Mountain region is kind of the opioid epidemic epicenter, right? Where the pharmaceutical companies came in with these new drugs and they promised that they weren't addictive and that they were perfect for coal miners. And it's called oxycodone. 
and it's non-addictive and you don't have to worry about that, right? And we all know how that story unfolded. But the way that this pharmacogenomics works, where you're looking at how bodies process the same medicine differently, the, the example I looked up was there's an enzyme that's produced in everyone's liver that has a very, very long name. That is the enzyme that converts the coding part of these opioids to morphine, which causes them to be effective as a painkiller. And what we have learned over the course of the years is that that enzyme is not produced the same from person A to person B to person C, but yet medications are all given out in what doses? Five milligrams, 10 milligrams, 20 milligrams, right? So even though every person, their body converts five milligrams of codeine different, 10 milligrams of codeine differently, that's not being taken into account. Really, when you're talking about dosing codeine or painkillers, it really goes by body weight and how much pain you're in. But there's this whole other field of, and how does your body deal with that medicine once it's ingested? So this is some exciting stuff when it comes to medicine, but it does raise these questions. But I think it is moving towards a way, you know, one of the big criticisms, Ron, right now of medicine, at least from what I'm hearing is, you know, it's become assembly line, right? You know, you go into your doctor, you have a 10 minute meeting, and then you're out the door with the script. But with these developments and breakthrough, you're really starting to get to these individualized ways that we can treat an individual for a disease instead of just treating a disease the same across all individuals when all individuals don't handle the disease the same way. So very exciting stuff. But certainly if I was a plan administrator, I would be earmarking the longer form webinar for this because there are a lot of implications and it's not cheap. You got to pay to play unfortunately, when it comes to these therapies. And that's something that each plan admin is going to have to sit down with and think, how do I provide the best plan for my participants? And how am I able to design a plan that is sustainable from a financial standpoint? So lots of things going into play there. You know, I'm glad you bring up the issue of pharmacogenomics and ensuring efficacy on an individualized basis. I agree that I think that's going to be a trend that we see increasing and maybe even becoming a prerequisite before the treatment itself will be covered by the plan. I do think there's gonna have to be some plans and patients and payers that are the trendsetters, right? The pioneers, because when these medications are new, there's not a lot of historic evidence. Being able to accurately determine whether it's going to be effective for a given patient based on their genetic makeup, it's a lot more difficult or mm, less accurate than if there is a long history of this medication being provided and you have that data to use. And so I think that it's a combination of time, a combination of creative and thoughtful payment methodologies and bravery. You know, some of these patients, some of these plans, they're going to have to be brave. They're going to have to be the trendsetters. They're going to have to jump in there and establish that baseline so that a few years from now, when the concept of pharmacogenomics, and they're going to have to change that phrase if it's going to become an everyday thing, you know, is going to have that level of accuracy and tell us for sure whether something is going to be effective. And I think that one-two punch of having medication that is customized to your genetic or cellular makeup combined with a test to determine what types of treatments are more likely to be effective, I think we're going to see some great results. And to your very first point about hemophilia, you know, the cost up front may be intimidating, but the long-term gains, I hope, end up making it worthwhile. So be sure to tune into our webinar where we discuss this topic in greater detail. If you're listening to this podcast, and the webinar has already taken place. It is scheduled for October 19th, 2023 at 1 p.m. Eastern. If you are listening to this podcast and October 19th, 2023 has come and gone, fear not. The same media page on the FIA Group's homepage, www.fiagroup.com, we house our past webinars. So you will be able to listen to a recording of the webinar anyway. So don't worry if you're not available or if that date has already passed, you're still in. So be sure to check it out. And as always, I am so grateful that you've joined us today to discuss this important topic on behalf of myself, Corey, the FIA Group, and of course, our producer, Pat the Man Santos. Thank you so much for empowering your plans with the FIA Group. Be well.